Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. Yeah, the 50 is 50 consecutive iron distance courses over 50 consecutive days, one in every U.S. state. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time I spent wrestling, if it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. My guest today is James, the Iron Cowboy Lawrence. If you don't know who this cat is, check out the Netflix documentary on him. It's called Iron Cowboy. He's a triathlete and is most known for his incredible 50-50-50, which means he did 50 Ironman distance races in 50 states in 50 consecutive days. It boggles the mind how a human being could possibly do that. If you don't know what an Ironman is, uh, I believe it's like 2.2 miles of swimming, 80 to 100 miles of biking, and then a marathon. So not only did he run a marathon every day for 50 days in 50 states, he also did the swimming and the biking this guy knows uh, another level of chosen suffering and mental performance and really enjoyed having him on the podcast. Obviously, he wrestled. Otherwise, he wouldn't be here. Wrestled from seventh grade through high school and had a big impact on his life. So I hope you enjoy it. Fan of the week goes to my man, Ben Edmondson. That's at Quan underscore Edmondson on Twitter. Give him a follow. He's an assistant coach for Sigourney High School. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Thank you for retweeting Gable the Goat Part 2. Really appreciate it. Which brings me to my last point, folks. Gable the Goat Part 2, which is a Dan Gable documentary podcast that I produced and directed, went live on Tuesday. Anytime I do one of these documentaries, it's the biggest project I'm working on at the time. It takes a ton of uh, love and sweat, and it, it would mean a lot if you went to check it out. So it's episode 109, Gable the Goat Part 2. Take a look at it. If you want it, want it sent directly to your phone, just text Dan Gable, one word, to 555 And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for James the Iron Cowboy, Lawrence. Peace! One of the stories I wanted to start with that just kind of exemplifies your mindset is you were biking up Mount Kilimanjaro, and you hit a point where maybe you were doubting yourself or maybe it was just a really rough patch, but you, you saw this group coming down, and one person in the group only had one leg. And it kind of allowed you to, to kind of reset and reflect um, on what you were doing. And so maybe just tell that story of how you got to biking up that mountain and what about that group made such an impact on you, if you know what story I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. And it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a really cool moment in my life. Of You know, we, we should always go through life and have moments of self-reflection and an opportunity to evaluate. And that was kind of an evaluation moment in my, in my life. It was after the 50 had taken place and a lot of challenges were being presented to me as far as people wanted me to come out and tackle their toughest race or toughest challenge or whatnot. And I had, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of desire to do that kind of stuff because I was now shifting my focus to family and our coaching business and all those other things. And big challenges take massive amounts of time and incredible effort, both physically and, and financially and, and mindset wise. And so I was turning most things down and I got a, I got a phone call from Africa and they said, Hey, we want you to come, um, climb our mountain. And I was like, nah, I'm not interested. And they were like, no, we want you to ride your bike up Mount Kilimanjaro. And I was like, okay, now we're talking, let's go. <laughs> and, uh, and then ended up starting to tackle that project. And 
got about uh, up to base camp 12,500 feet and there was a group of veterans coming down and as the story goes there was uh, two people in the group that only had one leg um, and I was complaining about how bad my legs hurt and so it's just like this moment of okay we have no idea when something's going to be taken away from us and just absolute gratitude and we have a choice on how we perceive and experience each adventure each obstacle each trial all of those kind of things and so for me it was a great moment um, and just a reminder um, to be grateful for what we have and what we're doing and when we're doing it and it's relevant right now in this moment of chaos to be grateful for what we have and self-reflect and self-audit and make sure our house is in order and, and uh, I remember standing on the top of Kilimanjaro and thinking back to that same group and there was another guy in that group that stood out to me and he was completely blind and I, I kept thinking to myself how how was it he was so happy and he couldn't even see this incredible view from 20,000 feet that I was seeing and it's because he was feeling and experiencing and being present and I really took that away from that moment about just gratitude and present and the choices that we make on a daily basis on how we experience what's going around in our life. And my mother always used to say to me, 10% of life is what happens to us and 90% is how we choose to react to it. And again, I hate talking about this, but right now we have a choice on how we're going to react to the chaos that's going around you. And that's ultimately all you can control. Parameters and things are going to be put into place and they're for a reason and maybe reasons we can understand and there's the whole camp that thinks this is ridiculous, and there's a whole camp that thinks, no, this is right where we should be doing, and then there's the entire huge camp that's overreacting, and all three camps have value and merit because of the perception from where they're sitting, and my advice to everybody is obviously just educate yourself on what's really going on and, and what this is, and then choose how you're going to react appropriately, right? And so that's that's kind of my experience with Mount Kilimanjaro that I got to have, and it was a good opportunity to sit down and self-reflect and 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 you know, always, always learning, brother, always learn. Take a little audit. And that's something that I know you're, you're doing some coaching now and we'll get to the, get to some of the services you guys offer. Cause it's, it's fascinating to me, but I think, I mean, why not hit on the elephant in the room? COVID-19 it's, it's, yeah. it's chaos out there. If you look at some people and, you know, I was feeling a little bit of stress last week and listen to Jack Cornfield on Tim Ferriss and he's a, a Buddhist monk of sorts and really kind of got me thinking about this is an opportunity to, to read more, to, to get into philosophy more, to deepen our relationships with our friends and family. So it's definitely scary, but um, definitely an opportunity at the same time. And everything you've said to me just reminds me of you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you react to external events. Yeah, I, I mean, when was the last time you were forced to shut down, self-audit, uh, reflect, ponder personal growth for eight weeks? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what a massive opportunity. And, and I understand that everybody financially isn't in a position where that's like, okay, but we can't control that. And and on the flip side of that coin, it's like, okay, self audit. And, you know, in, in the church that we are, that we, we, we um, live by and, and our lifestyle, they always say, is your house in order? And th this is a great moment to go, okay. This is a test. Is my house truly in order if something happens on an even bigger scale than, than what's happening right now? And, you know, I, I believe a lot of people are going to be OK over the next eight weeks and sustain themselves and life's going to go back to, to normal. And the, the trickle effect's going to be a couple of years. Um, but is your house in order and are you ready for that moment? And I am I'm actually super pumped um, and excited for the next eight weeks. I, I literally cannot remember when my schedule got wiped clean. Um, I had every single speaking engagement, which is my livelihood, taken away for the next little bit. I had every race cancel or postpone in the next eight weeks that was completely taken away. And so most avenues and my main sources of income and exposure has to do with large groups or gatherings. Right. Um, I have every reason to panic and overreact and whatnot but i am i'm looking at this as a math like you said a massive opportunity to restructure to come out on the other side of this stronger and fighting and you know i i'm really excited to spend time with my family and kids and build those relationships that matter and and all that kind of stuff so th this is truly 
an opportunity. And if it's not an opportunity, it's a massive wake up call. And people need to look at both of those as opportunities to say, is my house in order? Can I survive? Where's the opportunity for growth? I mean, what a, what a, what a time to do some personal development and to put systems in place and many tiny habits and goals to, to really start to create momentum. If people utilize, utilize this time appropriately dude they're going to be able to come out of this stronger yeah more educated more motivated more whatever you want to put towards it more tough more resilient more gritty um it is a fascinating fascinating time to be spectating to be part of um it is it's remarkable even during wartime, they still have sports. They still have a lot of the distractions that we're not going to have, bars, restaurants. So this is truly unique in recent history that I can remember, and even obviously well beyond that I can't remember since I wasn't even alive. But you think back to World War II, um, you know, ironically, the people of, you know, of the U.K. during the bombings of London, um, they look back on those times as some of the best ever. And Sebastian Younger talks about that in his book, Tribe, where when people have shared sacrifice together, you know, they feel a togetherness. And a lot of those citizens of London, it sounds crazy to say, but after the war ended, they felt more lonely than they did during the war when they were all huddled up together in the, in the, uh, in the subway system of London during the bombing because they had that shared suffering and shared experience together. So it brought people together. Sounds ridiculous, yeah. but... No, no, I, I totally see it. And I, and I think I think this is a precious time. To be yeah. honest with you, um, this is this is uh, a forced self-reflection family time that most people have gotten away from, have lost touch with, and I think there's going to be a lot of people that go, you know what, this is kind of awesome. Absolutely. Now we're talking a lot about suffering and 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 the mental game just in the first ten minutes here, and the reason you're so qualified to to speak on those topics is that you've um, induced a lot of <laughs> a lot of self pain to yourself through all these ultra marathons and ultra triathlons, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I want to go back to the origin story. And while you're on this podcast, uh, seventh grade, you're growing up in Canada. You somehow get involved with wrestling. How did wrestling hook you? And and when did that all start? Yeah, seventh, literally seventh grade. I was eleven years old, scrawny white kid that just loved sports, and I was doing. Every sport. And so when they said, hey, it's volleyball season, great, I play volleyball. Hey, it's basketball season, I play basketball. Hey, it's track season, I play track. They said, hey, it's wrestling. I'm like, okay, great, let's wrestle. And um, at the time, I mean, I, I don't know if you can see it in the background, but there's an entire – that shelf, there's yeah. two shelves there. It's the entire WWF 1983 to like 89 collection in its entirety. And so it was back in the Hulkamania and Warrior, Ultimate Warrior days, and um, I bought in, and I went, like, it was live in Calgary every uh, Friday night, Stampede Wrestling, and then on Saturday, it would telecast Stampede Wrestling and WWF. I went to WrestleMania 2, <laughs> and... And I know this isn't that kind of wrestling, but I was I was I was enga engaged and involved. And I, when somebody said wrestling at school and it's a sport, I was like, hell yeah, I want to I want to do that. And so just got involved, and it was it was actually a, a lot of fun. But man, when you say wrestling changed my life, it did. I mean, it. it I look back over the the course of my career and the things that I've gotten to do, and I'm big at individual sports, wrestling, triathlon, golf, and those all hinge on how strong you can be mentally. And so, I mean, I was a disaster. I was a total, I mean, I was, I'm a little bit athletic, but I had to, I had to work for it. I mean, I got, I got slaughtered my you know, <laughs> wrestling because kids have been doing it in camps and all these things. And from, from an early age and I just, I just jumped in and, and just tried to start figuring out, but I, I, I really did enjoy it. And then ended up wrestling all the way through high school and then for a couple years after with the um, University of um, uh, Calgary, not on the university team, but in the, on their club team. Right. And so it, it it gave things to you. What do you think changed the most or what what you know tactic or, or technique, uh, you know, both mentally or physically, did you gain from it in terms of were you a good student beforehand? Were you a good student after? Um, discipline, that kind of thing. Um, never a good student. 
Okay. I think the only, I think the only reason I graduated was because of wrestling. Um, <laughs> and they wanted me to keep wrestling uh, and stay on the team and whatnot. I think the the, the coaches were like, no, let, let, give give them the, <laughs> give them that, because um, I honestly no idea how I graduated. Um, <laughs> but 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 really, the the biggest takeaway for me is, um, the only way to fail is to is to not show up or to quit. That, that's literally the only way to fail. And for me, it was okay. I, I was very consistent with doing the drills and showing up to practice and just really, really um, just being consistent mm -hmm. and, and, and showing up. And, and I love, I looked forward to it. I loved it. Um, even, even when I was getting my butt kicked, I, I loved that, that just grittiness and wanting to learn. I think it, and it motivated me to want to get better. Cause I was like, well, if he can do that, why can't, why can't I? Mm -hmm. And uh, actually one of the coolest stories was, um, about consistency and whatnot there was a kid i was i was kind of on my way out of wrestling um you know my 11th 12th year there was this kid that came in and no talent lost every match just a, a total dumpster fire basically and i and that you know but he just kept showing up kept showing up and i got out of the scene and i was like man that kid that kid should, should quit you know he's he's never gonna amount to anything and I, I came back because I'd moved away. I came back and I was just like, hey, what was going on in the wrestling scene back home? And this kid actually ended up winning, uh, at least going to the national championships for Canada, if not winning his um, bracket, um, and just turned out to be this absolute stud. And it was only because he was consistent and showed up and really started to focus on his mind and the things he could control. And, I man, I was, I was so impressed with this kid's journey. Um, really had no business – um, accomplishing and, and doing what he ended up doing. It's amazing how just through force of will, you can, inconsistency, you can change who you are as a person and a wrestler. There's a lot of sports like that, but wrestling, man, it sure seems like, it sure seems like one that people come back to and primarily because it's offered through the school system, which is such a, such a blessing. Um, and so you, you have this experience with wrestling, you graduate, you move on with your life, when did you do the first run where it was the four mile fun run that your wife got you involved with? Yeah. So I would have graduated from high school in 2000, uh, sorry, 94, uh, probably wrestled through 96, 97. I was super excited. Um, my, my ultimate goal was the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Um, obviously didn't do that. Um, I, I, I wish I knew what I knew back. I wish I knew now what I knew back then as far as discipline and sticking with something and belief in yourself and all that stuff that I, that I preach now, but didn't, didn't happen then. And that's totally fine because the trajectory of my life completely changed. Um, and then, so 2004, uh, married two young kids, um, just trying to figure things out. And my wife was like, Hey, let's go for a fun run. And it was a disaster. And it just put me on a path to where, I found triathlon and loved the challenge of it. And it was an outlet in my young uh, adult married life. And I love the diversity of the training. And I started to apply the mental side of stuff that I, I grew up with, with through wrestling and just really started on a journey that over the, the course of a decade, we, we broke some Guinness world records and we've set a standard of, of grittiness and toughness. And, um, and to be frank and off the record, we're not done yet. Love it. I mean, I don't even dare to ask if there's, you know, what's next, you know, past the 50, 50, 50, because that is ridiculous. So we're going to talk about it. But um, w what do you have in mind in terms of, of next adventures? Is it still using that triathlete model of run, bike, swim? Or are you looking at other things as well? Um, it, it will be in the triathlon space. There is a what's next. And unfortunately, I cannot <laughs> stay at this point. Fair enough. I saw you guys were getting involved with something that Amazon did on a team race basis. That's coming out this uh, this fall, is it? Yeah, September. It's called the World's Toughest Race Eco Challenge, uh, which was a show back in the early 2000s. Um, it's adventure racing. It's Map and Compass. It's teams of four. Um, and Amazon brought it back out. It's a Mark Burnett production. Uh, Bear Grylls was the host. Um, we represent the, uh, the United States as one of their teams to to tackle this race. Obviously, I'm under <laughs> NDAs where yeah. I can't say it because it is going to be a 10 episode series on Amazon Prime, and uh, super excited about that. But that was, man, that that was an incredible experience and and uh, one that I I wish everybody could go. And again, it's 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 forced unplug, 
and self-reflection and do something hard that pushes your mind and your body and makes you self-reflect and bring into the the frame in front of you of what's important and what's not and, and all that stuff. I, I'm, I'm one of the massive things that I preach is being uncomfortable intentionally. And that definitely falls into that category. And I wish everybody could have the opportunity to intentionally do something different because I mean, difficult because reality is, is, yes, a lot of people have difficult situations and times are tough and, and people are struggling, but there's a lot of people that live very comfortable lives, mm -hmm. that become complacent and soft. Yeah. And, and those people need to seek discomfort and, uh, and they're not. That's almost the worst place to be is that, that middle ground where solid paycheck, you know, no stress, you know, from a money perspective. So, um, you're feeling pretty cushy there, but you know, one of the things you said is you seek intentional pain, uh, in 2008, something unintentional happened, right? The market collapsed. And I know you were in the, the mortgage business at that time. That, to me, just looking at your career, seems like one of the biggest turning points um, that probably happened because I've heard you say you went from listening to other people and what they wanted you to do versus just listening to yourself, right? And while you may have been successful in the mortgage business, wasn't what you wanted to do. So walk us through the, the 12 months following that and kind of how you didn't panic because I think a lot of people probably would have. No, that was for sure. That was for sure panic. I got, <laughs> I got four little kids uh, at that time. It was 2008 through 11. Yeah, fifth one on the way. And um, it, it was really a unique opportunity to where, again, Sonny and I, that's my wife, and we looked at it and we said, okay, let's let's not panic. We have a choice here what we're going to do. And again, it, it was an opportunity that completely changed our lives. And we, we could we could have looked at that and said, okay, we're done. Uh, let's pity ourselves. Let's feel sorry for ourselves. Um, but from the experiences that we've had in life, it was like, no, this is an opportunity to showcase grittiness and to show showcase some toughness and to get up and fight for what's possible and, and dreams. I get contacted all the time that people want to quit their job and go do um, their dream, their passion, um, or what they perceive as their passion as their dream. And most people don't even know what their passion is, and it's just an excuse to quit real life. <laughs> the reality is, and my number one rule is don't quit your day job to chase your dreams. Your dreams and your passions are chased, um, burning the midnight oil, and on the opposite end of you providing for yourself and your family. Um, and we were in a unique situation where that was stripped away from us, and we were allowed to go chase our dream and, our, and whatnot. Um, but, but I think a lot of people say, oh, you know, you, you quit everything to go chase this dream and it gives them permission to do so. And I want everybody listening right now, that is not permission to go quit on responsibility and life um, to chase your dreams. You you chase those dreams and those passions around providing for your family, providing for you and making sure your needs are met. And if it truly is supposed to happen, there will be a tipping point where your passion and your dreams can turn into your lifestyle and your income but i don't i don't i don't follow this huge notion where everybody has to be living their dreams and their passions and turn it into money um it, it's just unrealistic it, it's it's not going to happen and most people don't even know what it is and they're quitting their job to go find that and that's the worst place to be in i i think it's a huge mistake that people are making um don't don't ever don't ever quit plan a um, to chase plan B when plan A is is stability and you can do both at the same time. Well, one of the things I want to ask you is what what would you say your passion is? Is it ultra marathons or is it exploring or is it seeing how far you can push the body? Because I couldn't pinpoint it just looking at your at your resume here. It's golf. Really? Yeah. No shit. That's my favorite thing to do. If you look at my background, got we've got Tiger there. Tiger Woods right there. There's all the different courses I play. Um uh, yeah, it, it absolutely is. I'm not making money with my passion. Um, yes, I'm passionate about triathlon. Yes, I'm passionate about mindset. Yes, I'm passionate about helping people. Um, yes, I love pushing my my boundaries physically and mentally. Um, I'm not trying to turn my passion into my my main passion into my income. I play once a week and I love it and it's my escape. I think if I tried to turn my passion into my money, I would lose passion for that and it would become my job. I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is is that you, the, the, you, you lose that, right? Mm -hmm. And it becomes now a burden to have to do it. 
and and I think people are I think the word find your passion is abused and overused, especially in today's influencer or whatever you want to call this ridiculous space. Um, but but I, I mean, the way to find your true passion is to do a lot of do a lot of variety of different things and try different things until something really resonates with you. I didn't know wrestling was my passion until I did it. I didn't know golf was a passion until I did it. I didn't know triathlon was a passion until I did it. I didn't, you know, all of these things you don't know is going to be a passion until you do it, resonate with it and start to develop it. Um, I, I think people just need to live life and have experiences. And sometimes you have to have a job and do something you don't like. And that's where you build that toughness. And I say all the time, this uh, a high tolerance for monotony is an underrated superpower. And that's because you do you do stuff so that you can afford the time and money to do what you're passionate about. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a mistake for people to just every, everybody can't chase and live that. I just think it's stupid. Yeah, well, it is a it's definitely a buzzword right now to to quit to find your passion. But you know, and anyone who's done anything with with purpose, it takes years and years to even get to a place where you might even right. consider that. Dude, I, I here's what's crazy. It took a decade to get to the point where I could even conceive and do the 50. And the 50 is not paying me any money. I'm not a sponsored athlete. I don't get paid to race and all that. I took that as a opportunity and turned business out of it. I Most of my income comes from full-time speaking. I had to learn that craft. I had to develop. My passion wasn't speaking on stage. It's actually the last place I want to be. But I've realized that it's having impact. Now, having impact is one of my passions, and speaking is the vessel. I'm not. I'm not financially successful because I, because a, a sponsorship or a professional athlete and, and doing the 50. I'm financially successful because I took that as an opportunity, and I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, and I work my ass off. Right. right. That there's a huge difference between that, and so many people are like, "Oh, you woke up one day, decided to do 50 Ironmans. I'm going to go run across." the the North Pole and I'm going to be set for the rest of my life. But <laughs> uh, you need you need to ask yourself what what's what's the exit strategy? What's the game plan? Why are you truly doing this? Is it a passion? Anyone that contacts me to that because they're like I want advice. I want to do this. I want to do this. I, number one question: Hey, why why are you doing this? This has to be a passion project for you. Understand that overnight. This isn't. I did the I did the fifty five years ago and we're still building systems and trying to monetize different types of things and whatnot. But people just assume, Oh, you have a nice house. You did 50. You must've made millions of dollars the day after you crossed the, the finish line of the 50th one. No, 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 no. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It took me 10 years to get to that point, And it's taken me five years after it to of really, really hard work and refining that craft and understanding and learning Guys, that's 15 plus years of being an overnight success, <laughs> right? Right. And that's what nobody sees. If, you, if you're venturing in, and this is why I say do not quit your day job, because if you're venturing into the online entrepreneurial um, thought leader um, influencer. influencer space, <laughs> It's going to literally take 10 times longer than you think it is unless you have such a unique story. People contact me all the time. Hey, man, how do I become a motivational speaker? How do you do this and that? And I'm like, you have to figure out how to make yourself so different than everybody else and stand out at such an exceptional level that they call you. Right. Do something so great and exceptional that your phone starts ringing. Right. That, that's what people need to do. And that's not going to happen overnight. And that's not going to happen tomorrow. And that, especially when something like this happens, right? This one, you like, whoo, you <laughs> like, whoo, man, like, like, so get, many like, moments, like, like get ready. Right. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I wish, and I, I am the biggest proponent of dreaming, shooting for the stars, going all in, but man, be patient. Be patient. <laughs> well, and you said it. I mean, even to get to the point of doing the 50-50-50, you had done several um, world records before that, one of which was doing 30 Ironmans in a calendar year. 
and and then you start planning this this crazy ridiculous uh, journey of the 50 50 50 when did that start for you and for people who have never watched the netflix documentary what is the 50 50 50 yeah the 50 is 50 consecutive iron distance courses over 50 consecutive days one in every u.s state um it was uncharted territory it was uh, the, the idea came to us after um successfully doing the 30 ironman guinness world record through 11 countries all official events around the world um, and i realized hey man i i that was the hardest thing i've ever done but now that i'm through it i now have experience and knowledge and i want to continue on this journey and what what is possible now based on the experience that i've changed and the lessons that i've learned and so for me it was a okay what is the hardest thing i can think of and I modeled this after an, an ultra endurance runner, Dean Carnassus, who did 50 marathons in 50 days in 50 states. And he's had a very successful career post accomplishment. And I was like, man, if that guy did that with marathons, what would happen if I pulled this thing off with Ironman? <laughs> um, and, and so that's really what sparked this. And it was about race 27 of 30 in that year. And I was like, you know, I proposed it to Sonny and she was like, well, let's, let's really think about this and what this looks and feels like. And it took two, over two and a half years to physically, mentally, logistically prepare for it. And then, you know, as the documentary goes, it was still utter chaos mm -hmm. um, in, in order to do it. And so, um, yeah, that, that's kind of how it started, what the 50 is. So end of 2012, after that Guinness World Record, we just, we just said, okay, what, what, is, what is possible based on our experience and knowledge um, and then Sonny and I just really went all in hyper-focused and, and started to attack this goal. Yeah. We won't rehash every event of the 50, 50, 50, the, the documentary is incredible, but there's one little nugget in there that stuck with me the first time I watched it two years ago and, or a year and a half ago. And even now is uh, mile 30, you call it the rebirth, which is where you're, you event, you're day, day 30, day 30, excuse me, day 30. Uh, and you say it's kind of where your alter ego was born. And so, and, and if you watch a documentary, you'll see that after day 30, you actually started getting faster and stronger and you said you were on cruise control, but man, the first, <laughs> the first 30, it is, it is tough to watch just how much pain you were in. And, um, I can't remember if you were in Connecticut or not, but just talk us through that experience. So you're biking, you taught, ditch the bike and what happened then? Yeah. And, and I think, I think this rebirth moment is is one that everybody should strive to get to and very few make it to even that decision moment because, and as the documentary and the book redefine impossible shows is hundreds of events happen before that moment where most 99.9% .9 of people don't even get to this point to be able to make that decision. And that's what I'm trying to encourage people to do is get to that real pivotal moment where you've reached a limit. You're back, you're backed into that corner. Um, it's dark. It's depressed. It's alone. It's, all of those those you know worst emotions that we can think of as humans and then now what do you do like that that's the moment and and i mean this was a self propelled mission i could have i could have hit the panic button escape button easy button at any time and said you know what we're we're good i'm going to go but i committed to do something um to the best of our ability at that time with the knowledge that we had and um day 30 was that real moment where i said look i I can't control everything that's going on around me. I can only, I can only control what I have the power to focus on. And as soon as I started channeling where I was focusing, realizing why I was doing it and what the, the potential outcome could be and really started to, again, 10% of life is what happens to us. 90% is how we choose to react to it. And my life isn't based off of my circumstances. It's based off my decisions because of those circumstances. And ultimately, we got faster over the last 20, and my 50 and final Ironman here in Utah was an 11.32 Ironman, and we dipped under seven-minute miles during portions of the marathon and shed 3,500 people that showed up with, to participate with us that day. And so, yeah, it was, it was surreal. It was an out-of-body experience, and, and it was it literally one that I want people to figure out how to have, but everybody quits before the mind and the body sync up with each other and we start to control that chaos. And, and I will tease this a little bit. This is, this is what our next campaign is going to be. What is truly possible when you remove chaos and put systems into place? Now, what is possible? 
What is possible when you control your mind, when you biohack the nutrition, when you physically get ready? How do you go from zero to hero by controlling that environment, by controlling all of those things? What does that process look like? And it's a process that everybody can go through. We live in a, an information day and area where there's no excuse to not learn anything about any topic. Right. Like a kid that comes up to me nowadays is like, I don't have opportunity. I'm out. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, no, you, you, you don't understand. I don't care where you were born. I don't care who your parents are. I don't care any of that. Go to a public library and tap into the internet. Go to a McDonald's. I mean, everybody has a smartphone. Go to McDonald's and sit on their free Wi-Fi and start watching YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is zero excuse with technology and every free technology that everybody has access to. If you're not succeeding in life and progressing every single day, stand up nice and tall and look in a mirror and say, right now, my success is my fault. And also my failures and inability to progress is also my fault. Mm -hmm. We're in a day and age where people are not taking accountability for where they are in their lives. And they're so busy looking around trying to place blame on anybody that they can stop it it's your damn fault start making those changes there is no excuse in today's day and age you could strip everything away from me plunk me in a city where i know not nobody and i could rebuild a brand i could rebuild an empire i could figure out a, give me a trade that i know nothing about I could go learn that trade for free. Now, I'm not talking a medical doctor. I'm not <laughs> dentistry. I'm talking a physical skill, an asset that I can turn into money and create value for somebody else. Everything else is absolutely an excuse of somebody unwilling to do the work. Here's a, here's a, here's a great point. Um, and I love, I love this and it, it, hopefully this will change the conversation that people are having with themselves. And this is it. N new year's, new year's rolls around and everybody says, okay, new news resolutions. This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. I want the bigger house. I want more money. I want the better relationships. I want more free time. I, everybody knows that, right? That's not the question. The question is, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to achieve that? And most people, when they actually sit down and this is what it's going to take to achieve this, I'm not willing to make that sacrifice because that's going to take me out of my comfort zone. That's going to take me out of what I know. That's going to keep my fears the furthest possible away from me. And so I'm not going to do it, even though I know what I want. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm willing to sacrifice. And once you isolate what you're willing to fact sacrifice, what your fears are that's getting in your way, because fear is just a state of mind, right? This is about mindset and how wrestling has changed us and right. what we want, right? All of that goes into what are my fears and am I willing to face them? Mm. And it's it all comes down to that that theory you have on one decision, one tiny decision can drastically alter your life. I mean, I don't know if it boils down to you doing that fun run and how different your life is now, but there's just so many small decisions that can take place throughout the day that that can drastically alter your trajectory. I, I love Mel Robbins and I'll quote her. And she says, you're one decision away from a different outcome. Hmm. And, and I, I and to me, those decisions that you're making every single day is the conversation that we're having with ourselves. And every conversation, the voice never goes away as adults traveling around the world, speaking to thousands of audiences and, and millions of people. I've learned that us as adults, us as humans, we are our toughest critic. We are the reason that we're getting in our own way and we have to have those small wins because success breeds success and confidence breeds confidence. And so we have to get better and better at managing that voice, that bully that's in our own head. We're our toughest critic, right? It's not, it's, it's, it's the guy, it's the keyboard warrior and the social space and whatnot that plants this little seed that says you're not good enough. And then from that moment on, it's the conversation and the battles that you get to have with yourself to choose. Are they right? Or are they wrong? Or am I right? Or am I wrong? Do I believe in myself? It did not matter if anybody believed in me on the 50. The only person that mattered did I believe. Mm -hmm. I was offended 
leading up to the 50 when I would do a media com- uh, a media piece and they would ask me, hey, what do you think your chances are of completing the 50? <laughs> and I'd be like, what the, he- what the hell are you talking about? Like it's 300% happening. That's the type of belief and conviction you have to have going into something like this or there's literally no point in even starting it, right? Mm-hmm. You've got to buy in. Start drinking your own damn Kool-Aid, man. Just guzzle it because if you don't, nobody else is going to drink it. That's for damn That's sure. For- God, I've heard you say that a couple of times, and it's just good to hear you say it again here. And, yeah, I know we're, we're winding down on time here. The last thing I wanted to ask you about is, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, is you know, you've done so many races, so many workouts where you know, when any person does a workout, whether it's a mile or, or a marathon, at some point the voice starts to come in your head and tells you to, hey, you can walk the rest of it or, hey, you can call an Uber home. Uh, do you still get that even now when you're training or is that, is that gone away from the physical, physical workouts for you? No, dude. One of the hardest things for me to do even today as I'm building towards a massive goal is to get started every day. Mm. And the conversation starts before I even start. <laughs> and then every – Every race that I do, I retire, man. Halfway through the race, I'm like, F this noise. Like, I'm done. This sucks. And then you get to the finish line, and you've you've made it through that. You've won the conversation, and you're like, hell yeah, I want to do that again, right? Mm -hmm. And so I I always say never make life decisions, never make race decisions. One, in the middle of a race, in the middle of a big training camp, uh, when you're sick, and first thing in the morning when you're tired. (laughs) or in the middle of that. like those are the times where you do not make decisions you shut it down and go you know what i only make these following decisions when i'm in a good mindset when i'm in a positive atmosphere when i like those are the only time to make those decisions yeah it's like especially when you wake up that's when the real conversations go on 5 a.m and you're like no this decision's already been made this isn't that window of time where i can decide on this or not yeah what what, what everybody needs to do and maybe this is the most important part of the conversation is Write down what your ethos is, meaning what you stand for, and make it black and white. Like, ethically, where do you stand? And when you do that, every major decision becomes easy. Like, if you know what you stand for and what your ethos is, an opportunity, a situation, or something presents itself, and the only question is, does this align with my core values or not? Mm Mm-hmm. And if your ethos is black and white, that question becomes easy. And then it's like, no, I'm not doing that. No, that doesn't align with who I am not doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Is it my ethos? No, not doing it. Is it? Does it align? Yes. Easy decision. That's what I'm doing. That's simple. And, and if you mentioned you have a book that's come out and you have a website where folks can do online training courses. What, uh, what is that called and, and why would someone look you up on, on those type of services as we wind off here? Yeah, we, you know, the book's called Redefine Impossible. Um, it's on Amazon. It's also available on my site, ironcowboy.com. We just released the Audible version of it. Um, it's doing awesome. Um, we do a lot of speaking around the world. Uh, we have the documentary on Netflix. And we do we do two types of coaching mainly, and it's uh, for athletes uh, that want to do their first 5K like I did, our mm-hmm. first four-mile fun run, um, or qualify for the world championships at an ultra-distance triathlon. I mean, it's, it's not j- – I don't just work with – the elites and the top and whatnot. We work with everybody because we want everybody to have a, an experience. And one of my massive talking points and platforms is that everybody's heart is different. And just because my heart was 50 Ironmans uh, at that point in my journey, my journey literally started with me getting up off the couch and doing a form of fun run. And there's people that are in that moment right now. And there's people that are like, man, I, I want to try an impossible journey. That's impossible to me. And we'll help you do that. All that can also be found on our website, ironcowboy.com. And then actually this week, which will be a week earlier than when this releases, um, we are we are launching the first version of our Iron Grit program, which, which talks about the mindset. Um, it's an eight-week live session, group sessions with my wife, Sunny, and I um, talking about our core principles and things that you can do and implement in your life to become more mentally tough, because this is, this, this has grown way beyond, um, doing a tough physical challenge. Mm -hmm. And the correlation that I can draw between everything in everybody's lives is the little tiny space between our ears and those conversations that we have with ourselves, like we've talked about. And so I don't care if you're an at home mom, if you're, uh, I mean, I've spoken to NFL teams and, and major league baseball teams and whatnot, and that was, those are intimidating rooms. But what I did take away and realize is, man, those guys struggle just as much as everybody else because, again, we're human mm-hmm. and we're getting in our own way. And it's about belief and con- confidence and consistency and habits and all those things. 
And so Sunday and I realized that we've gotten to a point in our life, and trust me, we don't think we know everything. We are not experts in this field, but we've done some stuff. And and we have people asking us, hey, how do you do this? And so finally we were like, great, we, we will, based on all the questions and everything that we get, we will release an eight-week live program, starts this week. Um, and so the opportunity to jump in on this one has passed. Uh, but we are going to continue to do this and grow this. Again, it's on my website. It's called Iron Grit. Um, so we've got our physical training. We're, we're developing and launching. So excited to launch it this week, our mental training. If you want to learn more about us, it's obviously all on our website, ironcowboy.com. I'm most active on Instagram, and my handle is ironcowboyjames. Um, and we've alluded to it, but we're this next year is going to be massive, and we're going to reset history. Um, and, and I'm calling this project and our next book is going to be called Defy Logic. Once again, baby, history will be broken. And I think there's a lot of wrestling dads as well as wrestlers who could benefit from that mental course. So um, if once we get closer to the second round being released, I'll definitely let the listeners know, man. James Lawrence, thank you for your time, sir. Awesome, Ryan. Appreciate you. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text WRESTLE to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangedMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Come. Take care, y'all. Come. Take care, y'all. Come. Take care, y'all. Come. Take care, y'all. Come.